Did you know Variety, the children's charity, is the entertainment charity started by a group of show business people who found an abandoned baby in a theatre way back in 1928. These kind-hearted performers raised so much money to help the lost child that they began helping other children. And Variety, the children's charity, was born. Read the full story and support the entertainer's charity that supports kids in need today. Visit variety.org.au. You're listening to the School of Hard Knock Knocks podcast with me, Maury Morgan. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your next comedian. <laughs> Shouldn't drink on an empty head, you know that, don't you? That is the shittiest knuckle I have ever heard in my life. Everyone in this room is now dumb for having no. listened to it. That's a bucket list. <laughs> you have dangerously underprepared yourself for the shit that is about to get real. Not all students of the School of Hard Knock Knocks plan to become a professional stand-up comedian. Some do it to improve their business presentation and keynote skills, which is the reason for this interview. Cam Barber is not a comedian, although he has done a stand-up course. Rather, he's an 18-year veteran of professional presentation coaching who has helped the likes of Hawthorne Football Club, the CEO of Boost Juice, Janine Ellis, Andrew Denton and many other senior Australian public figures. In this interview, we discuss the challenges that face both public speakers and comedians, namely anxiety and being oneself, as outlined in Cam's book, What's Your Message? We also shed light on the term ethno-methodology and how it could be the new buzzword in comedy. If you give regular presentations in your day job or suffer from anxiety as a comedian, you'll love this interview with Cam Barber. Good morning, Cam. How are you? G'day, Murray. I am great. Good to talk to you. Oh, very good, Cam. Well, I p- apologise to you and the listeners. I've got a bit of a croaky throat at the moment, so a bit more husky than normal. You sound great, mate. Well, that's excellent. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Cam, now I believe you're an 18-year veteran of presentation and public speaking. Is that right? Well, I guess it goes back longer than that. I, I wow. started a business in presentation skills training and public speaking coaching about 18 years ago. Uh, but prior to that, I was a sales manager at yes. the radio network in Australia, and I wasn't a good speaker. I, I got nervous. I spoke too quickly. I probably used five times the amount of effort that was really required, yep. uh, trying really hard to communicate. Um, and so I did a, a presentation course, and I came away from that course more nervous and more self-conscious than before the course. Yeah. And that really set me on a path to find out, one, why the hell that was, yep. and two, what really matters uh, in public speaking. And the short answer is that we were being taught a whole bunch of stuff about worrying about your body language and never put your hands in your pocket and here's a list of 15 rules that you should never do and don't do that. Mm. And the, the mm. overall impact was we were told that we couldn't just relax and be ourselves. We had to put on yeah. some sort of a show that was based on this research And uh, I don't think that's true. I think the opposite is true. Um, It's message transfer that that matters most in a business presentation. Did they get your message? Did you bring your idea to life? And if you can do that, people accept your rough edges. People accept your imperfections. Richard Branson says, um, Bill Gates says, um, you know, they're not perfect performers, but they're great speakers. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. And you talk about being yourself and your natural self in your book, What's Your Message, which is a a great book to buy on Amazon, I should add. Let's go um, a little bit back in the book, because I think that comes a little bit later. And uh, what I found was the similarities between presentation skills and doing stand-up, and in particular, the, the topic of anxiety. You have a great quote, and it says, all anxiety is caused by uncertainty. I think that's a great quote, and it's probably the reason why you know we get that uh, a chill down our spine every time our partner says uh, we need to talk. <laughs> I, yeah. I wonder if you could elaborate. I believe there's four components, and I've read it, so I already know, but I'm just uh, getting you to elaborate on those four components of uncertainty and how we can actually reduce that uncertainty. And, and I'll link that to stand-up comedy. Well, All anxiety is the result of uncertainty. This is a really simple but powerful principle that helps you focus your attention and work out what are you uncertain about and then do something about it. Um, Unfortunately, before people understand this idea, their uncertainty and their anxiety is in a loop that just feeds on itself. I'm nervous. Now my heart's pounding. I'm more nervous. My hands are shaking. I'm more nervous. So 
So this is a wonderful idea that says break that negative loop in the mind and say, okay, what do I need to get certain about yep. and how can I? So uh, I love that. You're right. If someone says to us, whether it's a partner or a manager, and says, uh, hey, we need to talk, you know, come and see me at 2 o'clock. What have I done? What is that, good or bad? I don't know. It could be a promotion yeah. or it could be the sack. Or, yeah. yeah. So you're absolutely right. We want, to, we want certainty wherever possible. Uh, the four areas we focus on, just as a starting point, because once you know this idea, you can start to look at your own life and do your own thinking and say, yeah, what am I uncertain about and, and what can I do about it? Mm-hmm. But the four areas as a starting point we cover are, one, what's the environment? Yep. Have you got certainty about the environment? So uh, when I did do some stand-up comedy uh, five or six years ago, just as a challenge to myself, oh, right. um, you know, I was going to be on a stage at night with lights in my eyes Putting a microphone, a particular, usually a particular kind of microphone. So, because I hadn't done that a lot, I bought that microphone. Yeah, yeah. And I got a stand, and I shined some light, shone some lights in my eyes in my own uh, lounge room, so that I was reducing the the differences mm. between where I was practicing and where I was actually going to perform. Now, if you can get up on the stage, get up on a stage, see what it feels like to have the lights in your eyes, and. Look, look around and go, hey, where, how much room have I got? Will I pace? Will I move it? Will I lean on the microphone stand? Will I hold it in my hand? Answering all those little questions can increase your certainty and reduce your nerves. Yeah. And on that note, I, I know a lot of comedians, they, you know, sometimes comedians don't get everything you just described. They don't get the stage. They don't get the lights. They're in a pub, flat floor. There's people at the bar drinking. Uh, <laughs> the, the TAB, the, the right. horse racing might be on as well. I mean, that that is also the environment in which right. you have to work in. And if you're not ready for it, you know, I can understand why it makes you anxious. Yeah, it's a great shock. So, yeah, what can you do to get more certainty about the environment? And, you know, when I'm talking to uh, people who are making more business-type presentations, I say, are you using PowerPoint? Yeah. Have you got your own remote? Uh, anyone who's used PowerPoint who's listening might relate to this, where you, you go into a, a client boardroom and it's your presentation, but then they hand you a remote you've never seen before. Yeah, And, and it's right. got 28 buttons on it. And, and so you start mm. off with uncertainty going, Oh, uh, excuse me. How do you make the slide go to the next slide? Yeah. Yeah. So little, little things like that you want to tick off. Now, the second area of certainty, we'll rip through these uh, quickly. Yep. We call key message and structure. Yep. So if you're going to go into a presentation, do you know your message? And what I mean by that is, because when I ask people, do you know your message? They go, oh, yeah, sure. You know, it's sort of, it's a bit like, mm-hmm. I mean, the gist of it. state <laughs> yeah. in the exact words the way in one or two sentences, the message you're going to get into their mind that you want them to remember and recall. Yep. Uh, so you've got to get that right. And then structure, you know, breaking this into two sections, five sections, what's the key point for each section? Yep. So get certain about message and structure and, and you'll go a long way to feeling comfortable. Yep, yep. The third area is what are the potential questions? So uh, you should then put on your black hat, so to speak, mm-hmm. and say, Think of the most aggressive, rude person in the audience. Yep. What are the worst questions you could get asked? Write them down and write your response. Yeah, that's right. So no, no matter how bad the questions are, you're ready. Yep. And again, that reduces uncertainty. On that note, the um, obviously questions in a stand-up comedy scene aren't necessarily questions. They could be heckles as well. So That's a great point, Murray. What are the five worst heckles that you might get? and have an answer ready for them. Same idea. Work out what the five worst heckles you might get are and have a response. You know, this is all about reducing uncertainty and making you more certain and more confident on stage. What's the... uh, And then the final of these four things is uh, get some certainty about your physical state. And and what I mean by this is that when you get nervous, how does it feel? What happens to you physically? And then how do you react to that? And I'll give an example. So... um, I've got a coaching client who just recorded a, a podcast. So I, I run a podcast called mm-hmm. the Watch Your Message Podcast. And I was speaking to one of my old clients who was a, a senior manager in radio who had come from being a DJ on air. And he yep. said, on air, that's easy. I'm in the studio. I decide when the microphone goes on. I've got minutes to plan exactly what I'm going to say. I, I plan it. I test it. I switch the microphone on. I say it and I play another record. So in that controlled environment, he didn't have any uncertainty and no anxiety. No. Then he became a manager 
and he was in front of people and it was live and he had to deal with his ums and ahs and any, you know, mistakes or, or slight, you know, stutters or whatever. And instead of thinking, uh, oh, well, that's just life. Who cares? Here's my message. The thought going in his yeah. head was, oh, no, this is so unprofessional. They must expect more of me. Um, you know, this is terrible. And, of course, that just doubled and tripled his anxiety. So you just want to be clear about what's happening to you physically and mentally so that you can think about it clearly. Sure, sure. And I imagine if you are well rehearsed and you've done your key message and your structure, then obviously your state of mind is going to be in a better place because you're not going to have as much anxiety leading into that situation. Correct. But I, I think it's worth saying one thing here, that there's a difference in my experience between, uh, let's call it a business presentation and a stand-up comedy bit or gig. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the, the most sort of dramatically um, differencing I found when I did it. As a business presenter, I would argue that you shouldn't rehearse too much. Uh, we have a thing in the book uh, called the one-minute rehearsal, and that's where you rehearse the start mm -hmm. in the exact words, the end in the exact words, and then just a few of the key points that you want to highlight throughout. But yep. you don't rehearse word for word. Because generally speaking, business presenters aren't making the same presentation every single time. Right. They're making different presentations. And if you try to you know, learn it word for word, one, you probably won't have the time. Uh, two, if you get interrupted with a question, you can really lose your track because you're trying to yep. you're trying to do it like a script, word for word. And three, often the life is out of it. You know, your mind is elsewhere as you try to remember exactly how you rehearsed it last night in front of the, the mirror yep. instead of you know, I know the key points word for word, but I can add these sentences as I go based on a bullet point. Whereas with stand-up comedy, oh, man, that is tightly scripted, sure. heavily rehearsed. In fact, you know, what we were talking about this before, one slight change in word can make a huge difference where people laugh their heads off or they go, oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yes, I, I say rehearsal's good, but don't overdo it. Because often that puts a pressure on you that you don't need to worry about in a business presentation. I understand. Well, in, perhaps we can differentiate between a normal Monday to Friday business presentation and perhaps uh, many of the people that do our course actually get invited, they're keynote speakers. So they're uh, doing a 30-minute, 45-minute, maybe an hour presentation on an area of expertise, whatever that may be, and they've got an audience of 300 people in front of them. Obviously, they can't ad-lib the whole one hour. They've got to have some structure. So perhaps that's the that's kind of the, the bridge between what you're discussing in the business presentations, that keynote presentation where you're an expert, you've got to throw in information, you've got to have the stories. It has to be re reasonably structured because you're, um, you're being paid to, to, to tell a message, whether it be motivational or well, inspirational or... Well, that's a good point. And, and let's, let's stop here because it's actually a really important point to, to understand to be a great speaker and a comfortable, relaxed, natural speaker. Uh, it depends. Mm. So there is no rule. There is no one yep. right way. So some, as you say, some keynote speakers pretty much do one speech all the time. And in that situation, there's nothing wrong with rehearsing every word and, and, yep. and getting the stories right and, and getting a, you know sort of the nuance of each word right. But people are also different. So I've coached people like Janine Ellis from Boost Juice and um, Shark Tank, uh, Andrew Denton. When I say I've coached Andrew Denton, I didn't have to teach him how to speak. I just helped him sort his thoughts and his key messages. No. Um, Jules London, so on. And, and all these people are different. Yep. So Janine Ellis, for example, said, I don't want a script. I never want a script. I want to know the key points. I want to be able to go and tell a story that might be slightly different. The words of the story might be slightly different in each event, but the key point is right and never changes. Right. And so it's a personal preference. Yeah. And, and this, this course that I did 20 years ago that threw me for a six uh, said there's, there's one right way. Follow the rules. These are the rules. Well, I would argue that's just the wrong way to look at it. They're not rules, they're guidelines. And you've got to learn about yourself, mm. what your preferences are, what makes you better. Do you want it tightly scripted or do you want it loosely scripted? Test it, what works better for you. But either way, you've got to be sure about your messages. You do want to test and rehearse the key messages 
whether you do the more ad lib or the more scripted. Yeah, agree, agree. Well, the interviews that I've done to date, I think you're number 33. So the 32 other stand-up comedians that I've interviewed, uh, yeah, quite varied. So some of them are very scripted. Uh, Someone like Jack Levi, who's also known as Elliot Goblet, he has very strict jokes. I mean, Mm. the joke itself, they're one-liners. They have to be scripted. And then you've got someone like um, Richard Stubbs, who was a more recent interviewee, and uh, and he gets up there and he does do a little bit of ad libbing and the jokes that work he refines them mentally but he doesn't write them down word for word so yeah you're right there's um there there are guidelines as you say well no you know I, I think uh, when I've gone to watch stand up comedians um you know there there you can see some are scripted and some of some of the experienced ones just sort of come in and they tell stories and they uh, ask the audience for questions. And say, oh, that's a good point, you know. And then it's the question from the audience that lets them go into the story and, and make a point. So, yeah, what works for you? Test it, try it, and find out. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's that's also important because uh, a lot of comedians do interact with the audience. So, in a keynote or a business presentation, you might get a question that you've predicted that you think will come up in a stand-up comedy situation, you might elicit the conversation by who's got a cat here, for example, or who who likes dogs, or has anyone been overseas? And then you're going to expect responses, or, or maybe you talk to the person in the front, hi, how are you doing? Um, you know, where are you from? Which suburb are you from? Or uh, is this your husband? So, yeah, going back a step earlier, you were talking about sort of the, the type of questions that might come up being aware of those potential responses is, um, helps you, again, maintain that control over your anxiety, which is what we're discussing. Yeah, and, and I like it too. You know, when you, you know roughly what you want from the audience, but you want to engage them and involve them, yep. and you say, yeah, who's travelled? And, you know, you know you've got a travel story, and probably someone will say something that will let you go. Yeah, that's, that's a clever way of, of right. you know, connecting more strongly with the audience. Yeah, absolutely. And it does look, it does give the impression that you're ad-libbing and ad hoc um, shooting from the hip. But, and look, and just, and just to, to say one point here, so, you know, Elliot Goblet will never want to do that. And that's great because that works for him. And then someone else might say, oh, I absolutely love doing that. So, you know, you're going to use these as guidelines. Yes, to test and find out your natural preferences and your natural strengths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go deep now. Let's go into uh, in, into words. Let's go into the, the concept of ethnomethodology. Now, it, this, <laughs> this word jumped out of the page. I was reading your book. I'm thinking, uh, that's the first time I've ever tried to pronounce that word. I think I did a pretty good job there just then. Now, this is my understanding. It's the study of people's methods for making sense of each other. Is, is, did I get that right? Yeah, you did. Let me just uh, – actually, that's, I know where that is. <laughs> yeah. So, look, there, there was a great book that I read probably, you know, 17, 18 years ago, early on when I was starting to do my own research on what mattered and what didn't and how can we throw off the shackles of these rules and, yeah. and this sort of – um, armor, this performance armor we're told we all have to add to ourselves before we're allowed to get up and speak to an audience. And I found this great short book called yep. Why Didn't You Say That in the First Place? And it's a cool title, right? Mm, it's very right. funny. Uh, why didn't you say that in the first place? Well, what, what he talks about within this book is that misunderstandings are normal. Yep. They're, they're everywhere. That, that words, in fact, are all vague. That if you don't understand the context, that's going on in the speaker's mind, those words don't have the same meaning to you. So um, this was sort of a really important revelation. And uh, I, look, I love the book, but he probably got the idea across in three or four pages and then, you know, spent the next hundred. Mm, and then kept so going. Call, but it's, mm. You know, they've got a science to it and good on them, that's great. But the science is called ethnomethodology which is basically how can we speak more clearly? I just thought that was hilarious. Anyway, you, you saw it too. I think we've got a scientific word for a comedian now, an ethnomethodologist, <laughs> because that's exactly what comedians are doing. They are refining a sentence that in one form would not be funny at all or in another form right. would be misunderstood completely. And they're cutting words out. I mean, that's the, the golden rule or you know, rule of thumb of comedians is to, is to trim and cut 
all the the fat yeah. out of a sentence to make it funny and yeah. also put in specific words that will that are funnier than other words or uh, that relate to a pun one word may may be a pun one word that's a synonym will not be a pun yeah so I think we've got it ethno methodologists <laughs> uh, well that's funny for you and me I'm not sure that's <laughs> going to catch on but I love what you're saying here so I would call what you just described the, the skill of messaging. Develop your messaging mm. skills. Learn to speak in messages. And, and by definition, eliminate every word that's not required. Yep. And so we've got an example in the world of someone who's actually good at this amongst uh, a certain other personality qualities, and that is Donald Trump. Mm. Now, <laughs> Donald Trump, for example, you know his, his political opponents, whether he was in the trying to just become the Republican candidate or in the campaign against Hillary Clinton, his uh, uh, politician uh, opponents were saying, we need to talk about immigration reform and five or six or more words or three sentences. And he just said, I'll build a wall. Yep, yep. So he actually is very good at messaging, uh, make America great again, uh, cut red tape, Drain the swamp in Washington. Mm. Uh, so I would say that whether you're a, you're a public speaker, uh, a, a comedian, uh, or a parent who's trying to influence their children, you need to get better mm. at your messaging skills. Yeah. And and I'd say this too, Maury. If if there was only one one reason to do a stand up comedy course, it would be. I mean, there's more than that, but but I would say just mm. to get the ability to cut. Yes. To edit. So pull out words so that you can now speak in messages, or I don't know what you say, talk, what you call it as a comedian, where you know you speak in lines. But the short, sharp message is much more powerful than the long sentence. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, one, one again, another rule of thumb is you know putting the key word as the last word typically so build a wall mm-hmm. for example is is right. a very strong message whether you agree or disagree with it versus um i have a plan to build a wall that will span from texas through to you know um you know florida good point the last word being florida it it doesn't stick in the mind whereas the the key word previously was a wall and that's a very strong word yeah so you're absolutely right there's um good, sadly good point. sadly uh, he has uh, mastered that technique yeah and he's actually he's shaking everybody else up because people are realizing that uh, even though he's he's rude to people and he sort of breaches normal parameters of, of social conversation, yeah. people are still remembering these messages. That's right. So the opposition needs to understand this if they're going to compete because their messaging is vague and long and constantly changing. And so we'll see how this pans out. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and whoever follows onwards, it's oh, we're going to have politicians that talk in Twitter levels, yeah, just 146 That's right, characters. That's right, tweetable tweet. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's not a bad way of looking at it. What is the tweetable tweet of, for this project or this subject or this yep. change? That's yep. a really good way to think about it. Well, Simon Taylor, a, a comedian, a Aussie comedian, who's now um, in the US doing great things and, and writing for TV shows in the US as well as his own stand-up, he talked on an interview previously where he actually got his skills in messaging through Twitter. And uh, he's old enough that... Instagram didn't exist. Right. Twitter was there. He was limited to 146 characters, so had to cull any unnecessary words. Whereas millennials today who are mm. starting in the comedy space, uh, they, they've got little apps that on their phone where they can add almost any number of words on top of an image. Uh, and, and yeah, so, yeah, Twitter helped him develop his comedy, I guess, focus. Yeah, good. it's a good discipline. All right, well, let's go back. Earlier you talked about natural style, and that's definitely something we see at the School of Hard Knock Knocks class where someone walks in and says, you know, I really admire Stephen Wright or I'm a, I'm a big fan of Dave Hughes or, or whoever. And you can see when they get up on stage that the style that they're portraying isn't their own natural style. It's somebody else's. They're just it might be their own jokes, but it's it's in a style that people can easily recognize as not their own. In a presentation space, in that keynote and business presentations, how do you elicit the natural style from from a person who may be mirroring somebody that they've seen on a TED presentation, for example? Mm. Yeah, it's a good point, and it happens a lot. It's really sort of a natural thing to do, isn't it? If you're 
uncertain, you, you try and look for someone you can model yep. uh, to, to place some certainty in those actions. The, the, the main way we do it when I'm working with somebody when, when I'm making a, a presentation to a group is to show, to demonstrate that natural style is more effective at connecting with an audience. It requires less effort by you, therefore it's easier and, and easier for you and, and reduces the anxiety. Mm. Um, and that the the arguments for putting on a, a show, so to speak, uh, are myths. Yeah. So I'll give an example. Uh, a lot of people have heard the myth that your body language is more important than your words. Mm-hmm. Now, your body language can be more important than your words, but they're two completely different statements. Mm-hmm. Right? So you've got to say, well, hang on a minute. In what situations uh, is your body language more important than your words? And the answer is if your body language contradicts your words. Yeah. So, you know, if you say, I'm really happy to be here, and you're looking down at your toes, people go, no, you're not. You yeah. don't look happy. Yeah. Therefore, the body language is speaking louder than the words. But, but as a general rule or a general guideline, your body language is not more important than your words. Yeah. And if you're relaxed and in your own natural style, your body lang- language will effortlessly follow what you're saying. Yeah. And some people have a lot of gestures and some people have few gestures and that's fine because every style works. You know, you just talked about comedians from Elliot Goblet who doesn't move and has no gestures, yep, yep. Uh, you know, to someone like, um, you know, someone who dances around the stage or, or is very active. Yep. So one, there's proof and evidence that no one style is better than another. Mm-hmm. All styles have impact. Two, when you put on an effort, the chances are that you might look fake. Yeah. You see, if you're faking, there's more chance that your body language might match your style because you're you're putting that body language on. And so without going into all of the evidence I show now, I just I, I break it down to four or five different steps and go, can you see this makes no sense? Mm. It wastes effort and it doesn't connect with your audience. It increases anxiety and adds a risk that people won't connect with you. Yeah. Uh, so why not do this? Now, I think... From a comedy, stand-up comedy point of view, one of the things that I found helpful, which you probably, I'm sure you do, uh, that can help people find their own style or just be comfortable within it, Mm -hmm. is to make sure the jokes they're coming up with are really mined from their own life. Yeah, that's right. We do. So if you're telling a story about when you were a kid and your dad did this or you did that or something like that, um, you know, that's when you're like, no, no, just, just live that as you lived it. Um, and, and I find that, that that will probably help people um, brush, throw off the shackles and just find comedy or energy in their own style. Yeah. Yeah, definitely agree with that. Yeah. I mean, you, you're absolutely right. And we've seen comedians over their life, as someone like I mentioned, Dave Hughes, for example, when he started comedy, he was a slacker. He was sit, sleeping on the on his mate's couches. Uh, and that was part of his comedy. He was the slacker comedian. Uh, today, you know, he's married, got kids, lives in a very expensive house, recently bought another very expensive house. So, of course, he can't go back into the slacker comedy. He's pretty much written off a lot of well, that. Well, no, and he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke or something. He runs every day, he's fit, he's healthy. I mean, you know, he's he's a, a terrible failure as a slacker. So you're <laughs> he right. Is, he's he got, is. He's got to change that. Yeah, he's, he's improved everything except that accent, though. He's maintained that, hasn't he? <laughs> well, it's unique. It's his uh, calling card. Might work yeah. Well, fantastic, Cam. It's yeah. um very important. And everything we've talked about is in your book. What's your message? It is available on Amazon. You know, paperback, good bookstores, any online platform. Yeah, some of the bad ones too. <laughs> and the um, the, you're a presentation coach. So aside from writing books, you also get out there and you've you've name dropped a couple of people, a couple of celebs in there. <laughs> you also coach people and groups. Yeah, and we do messaging, uh, consulting. So Hawthorne Football Club, another drop another name. Yeah, uh, you know we worked with them starting ten years ago uh, to position them as the most professional club in the competition. Yeah, and that was a messaging decision that that was repeated and incorporated into many different things, and now they're known as that. So we do we do messaging, consulting, coaching, training, and if you're interested in that, you can find the details at vividmethod.com. Yep. And then there's also some other free things. If you're interested, we, we've been doing some podcasts for the last few months and we're interviewing people like uh, you know, Jules Lund, Andrew Denton, but also doing profiles on great messaging experts. So we just did one on mm-hmm. 
uh, Paul Hogan. Uh, wow. Anyone who's listening, you'll, you'll love it. Go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and listen to the What's Your Message podcast, Paul Hogan episode, where I argue that he helped Australia's success to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars Yeah, because he put an idea into Americans' heads, which was Australians are friendly, g'day, mate, shrimp on the barbie, no worries. And he basically convinced the whole country to welcome every Aussie with open arms. And that made life easier for business people, actors, performers, and so on. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, he's great. Um, going back a step to um, the mo- the mottos of Hawthorne and Hawthorne, that helped. Do you know who helped Essendon with their whatever it takes motto? Because that that didn't work out so well, did it? I don't. I, I, see, I see where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> that, went, yeah, that was a little bit close to the right. bone, wasn't that it? Right. Um, hey, do you know what? Look, now, I don't know enough about it to speak with authority, but sometimes... Hmm. Messages can backfire like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, th- th- you've got to be careful. And yeah. probably anyone who put that message out wasn't thinking to cross line, dubious lines. But, um, yeah, you know, maybe that was in the heads of people. Yeah. So, yeah, good messaging is a powerful effect. Uh, the Hawthorne one is great, too, because it not only works externally, so we aim to, to the members and so on and to the competition. We aim to be the most professional club. That's why we're mm, making this yep, decision yep. and that tough decision. And you think it's you think this was a uh, you know an aggressive call. Well, the only way to be the most professional club is to make these aggressive calls. Yeah. Uh, so it works to the to the external, but it also works internally. So if you work for Hawthorne, you know, hundreds of people, uh, over a hundred people work for this club. Uh, you know, you understand that we aim to be the most professional, and that's the the focus you have internally. Yeah, I agree, agree. For those who are not living in Australia, who are going, what on earth is this Essendon and Hawthorne? We are talking about the Australian Football League, or AFL, and uh, it's, a, it's a game that uh, all Aussies know and many Aussies follow, uh, and no one outside the rest of the world has a clue about. They don't have a clue, and you know what, mate? That is a great tragedy, because it is the best ball game in the world. It is. It's so much fun and so fast and engaging. It is, it is. I agree with you wholeheartedly there. Um, well, what have you got planned in the future? Are we? Is there another book coming out? Are you doing an online course? Are you going on a world tour? Uh-huh. Where are we going to see Cambaba? Well, I, I guess I'm doing world tours on, on a regular basis. I visit the US yep. uh, many times a year and, and, uh, and Europe uh, to do those things, speaking and coaching and, and uh, consulting on messaging. Mm-hmm. But for the audience here, we're, we're doing more podcasts, which are free. And probably in the next 12 months, we'll put together uh, a range of videos. You might call them video podcasts, but video short little clips and and some longer interviews just to try and get these ideas and these examples of messaging that are all around us, whether you're a parent or you're promoting tourism or you're trying to sell a product or, you know, uh, to bring help bring those to life. Fantastic. Well, that uh, the book again is What's Your Message? Also the same name as the podcast as well. Uh, people can Google you and, mm-hmm. and get get hold of you through um, through that. Um, well, thanks very much, Cam, in, in sharing the link, the common links between keynote presentations and comedy and in particular anxiety and being natural and how that the, those, those concepts relate to both forms uh, of presenting. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Mike. Wonderful. Well, Cam, thanks very much for your time today. Uh, Enjoy the rest of the week, and I look forward to having another coffee with you soon. Thanks, Mike. It's been an absolute pleasure.